special bonus episode of Matt Chat. I wanted to bring Mr. Neil Halford on to talk about his Kickstarter project, Thief of Dreams, mostly because, uh, much to my surprise, this rather modest Kickstarter goal has, has not been met. He's trying to reach, uh, trying to raise $24,000 to write a novel uh, called Thief of Dreams, and the inspired by the uh, game Betrayal at Crondor. He's uh, not doing too badly, but he's got quite a ways to go to reach that goal, so I thought I'd have him on to talk about the project and see if some of you guys can be moved to invest in this thing. I know I, for one, would be very disappointed if it doesn't make. Uh, Neil's a great guy, and I really like his writing and want to see this novel, so I thought this was worth doing. If you want to make a pledge to the Kickstarter, I will have the link in the show notes, so please uh, go do that if you are at all interested. Uh, do not wait. Uh, there's only a few days left, and it's all up to you guys at this point. So, Anyway, without further ado, here is Mr. Neil Halford. No, no, I guess it's been a while. How long, ago? How long ago was it when we did our... We did, was it... Let me see. We were in the middle of the... Of the Wildman campaign, and that was mid February. Is that right? Maybe. It's January. I know some people. Of course, we. I released the first part of that video last week, and I got a few comments about. You know, they didn't. They thought it was strange that we're still talking about Wildman at that point. Right. Right. Well, well, it's just like you got all those people. You got it. You got interviewed. So it's just like. Uh, and of course, the thing about it is too is it's not like you're just recording it, putting it up, you're, I, you know, all of that cool stuff. I mean, and it's awesome. My wife and I were both laughing that you got all that great source stuff. You got the, the footage from Space War and all that other stuff. And so you're putting a lot more work into it than I think most people really understand. So, so I definitely well, I learned a lot, too. I, when you said Space War, I thought you were talking at first about computer space. But then when I went to you know, find the footage, I realized, that, no, 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 this is a whole different uh, machine and everything. So that was really cool. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was kind of a kick because my wife had never actually seen, you know, the seen the game playing or whatever before. So she got a kick out of that and Star Raiders and all of this stuff. So that was really cool. <laughs> Have there been any updates from, uh, from Chris or any gas powered games, Wild Man? Uh, well, uh, oh, uh, about all that other stuff. I mean, I, I know they, of course, they got bought out and uh, I they're still kind of in the process, I think, of, of their acquisition stuff. Uh, but I, I don't really know what's going to happen with that. I will say I don't think Wild Man's coming back uh, because if the, the new companies, if Wargaming's intent had been to make Wild Man, uh, I'm sure they would have backed the project or made some kind of announcement whenever the acquisition got made. I mean, this is not coming from Chris. This is not coming from whatever. This is just whatever my own gut tells me. Uh, and so I, I, I'm guessing that that's not going to be whatever... The, the first thing that comes out of out of gas power now, whether it happens later on down the p- pipe, who knows? I, I really couldn't say. Have you uh, Chris is Chris doing great, actually. Like you know, Chris is, is okay? really excited. He said, "You know, th- this was they they got the, the this major injection of of cash into the company. They're going to be bringing people back that they had to let go." Uh, so it saved the company. Uh, no, no if, and, or buts about it. And so uh, he's really excited. Uh, Kimberly, you know, his wife uh, is just just in, uh, really ecstatic about stuff. And so uh, I, I'm really happy to see that happen for them. So so uh, when it, whenever that happened, no one was happy for them than I was. So they're gonna bring you back for Dungeon Siege. Was it four? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I wish. That that, that that was the case, but of course, Dungeon Siege is in the hands of whomever it's in the hands of. It was it's Square now, I guess, and so just unless something really strange happens and, and Dungeon Siege ended up back in their hands, uh, I, I would love to do it, uh, but I just that's just not going to happen. <laughs> well, let's talk about the the book then. Sure. Uh, so, how did you? Is this something you've been planning for a long time, and this is you know the you finally found the time to do it now, or is this sort of a you know, how did this uh, idea begin to incubate, I guess? Uh, well, of course, the uh, origins of this story kind of go back to Betrayal at Crondor. Um, uh, there, uh, the original plan that we had for Betrayal at Crondor was that the series was, was going to revolve around the character of Owen. Um, and uh, the concept that we'd had is that he can't be the, the ultimate, you know, top-tier magician in the world because that's Pug. And we, we couldn't really retell that story. And so we needed to have some kind of a new path that we could take Owen on. And so we just said, well, okay, well, what are we going to do with him? Because he's, he's a magician. He's interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, but one of the things about Pug is that 
hug always kind of sat, you know, he, he divorced himself really from the kingdom. He, he felt that this power needs to stay out of the hands, out, out of, you know, large, you know, political powers. And, and uh, so that's going to be a slightly different thing with Owen, though. Owen was a noble. And so I thought, okay, what if we do something a little uh, unusual where we say, Owen wants to use his powers. He's not going to be a top-tier magician. He knows that he's not going to be a top-tier magician. But what if he takes the, the know-how that he's learned about magic and we have him working for the kingdom, and we make him a spy. And he ultimately rises to power, and he becomes sort of the, the king's chief spy master. But he's using magic in order to basically uh, kind of pursue that, that, that path. And so, unfortunately, of course, after uh, the sequel, Thief of Dreams, or, or not actually this Thief of Dreams, but a Thief of Dreams, uh, the original, the original uh, title for the first sequel to Betrayal at Prondor was going to be Thief of Dreams. And so whenever that title didn't happen, mainly because of politics that were going on internally at, at, at Dynamics, uh, I still liked, wanted to do that storyline. I love the idea of having someone who was sort of like James Bond, but they had magical powers. So, so it's, replace all the gadgets you know, from James Bond. So we don't have Q. We have these magical capabilities. Uh, and you have, have spies that are out you know, kind of dueling against each other using these magical abilities. And so that was sort of the inspiration for the storyline that we, we, we have. And so obviously I can't do Owen, and Owen is, 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 is locked to the mid universe, and the, the rights to, uh, the gaming rights to Ray's universe are actually locked up with Iron Realms right now. And so for, it's a, a, an MMO uh, that's actually set in mid uh, and so I guess, I guess the deal is, is for as long as, as those guys are still doing business, the gaming rights to Feist Universe are tied up, or at least that's as far as I understand it. Ray and I haven't had, had just enormously deep conversations about this, but whenever I started floating the idea about a year or so ago about, hey, you know, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of Betrayal at Crondor, it'd be kind of cool to go back and, and do a, either a remake or a reboot or something else with it and uh, with better graphics and with all this cool stuff. And and Ray's response to it says, well, that'd be great, but unfortunately, you know, here's the deal is, is these rides are tied up right now. So that kind of got taken off the table. Uh, and I said, okay, well, if we can't go back and do that, and I can't actually finish the story that I started with Owen, well, what can I do with it? And, of course, the concept for, for, for this has been sitting for a long time, that being the case, I need to create a new universe, new characters, and all this other stuff. And so that's where sort of the, the roots of this story began. Um, now... Why a novel? Why now? Um, so whenever I was talking to Chris about uh, Wild, the Wild Man Project, he actually initially approached me with the idea that I was going to write a tie-in novel for Wild Man. That was actually going to be my primary role on the team, is to write this novel. Then that novel was going to actually provide the lore for the game. Um, and while they were building the technology out and everything else. And so it was kind of a weird case of it's almost like going out and hiring an author, having him write it, and then licensing his universe in order to put it in your game. So that was sort of going to be the weird situation I was going to be in on Wild Man. Uh, and so, of course, obviously, as, as I was developing the storyline and I was developing the lore, I'd be sharing that with them, and they'd be using that to kind of flesh out the world that they were creating. So, so I was all set to write a novel this year. Um, and so that's what was sort of in my head and what I was doing. And so I started doing all the, all the world building and kind of getting my feet back into that world because it's kind of funny because I, when I was in college, I took tons and tons of hours of, of novel writing classes. I actually wrote a book that none of you will ever read. <laughs> Only a handful of people have ever seen this novel. Uh, uh, but I, I wrote a novel whenever I was in college called This Realm Alone, which was kind of this weird... Imagine taking sort of high fantasy and you mix it with Dune, and that's sort of Tell what you I end up with. I read that on WikiLeaks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, great, fantastic. Um, uh, I'm glad it got out somewhere. I guess I'm um, no, but um, uh, so I was heavily under the influence of, of of George Herbert whenever I was whenever I was back in the day, and and so. Uh, but anyway, so I wrote this novel, and so I actually, that's kind of where my writing roots actually start, is doing novel writing. So then I made this weird detour in doing games for all these years, and of course, what I'm best known for is creating games that have really strong stories to them. 
Um, and so, so for me, I was kind of back in this, this, this mindset of, okay, I'm going to write this novel. It's going to be kind of fun. I can go back and kind of reacquire that skill set and everything else. Uh, and then when Wild Man didn't happen, uh, then I was kind of going, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Um, uh, because unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, like I said, their, Chris's company is, is doing very well. They were acquired by, by Wargaming, uh, but they're still very, very early days. And, and so uh, I, I don't know for certain what, what kind of game they're going to do. Uh, given the fact they were bought by Wargaming, I'm going to guess it's probably a strategy title. But again, that's not coming from Chris or for anybody else. That's just me guessing. Um, and so, uh, so anyway... Uh, so I, I was kind of going, okay, well, what am I going to do now? Um, uh, it's been kind of, a, kind of a rough few months because a lot of the places that I have been used to getting contract work for went away. <laughs> uh, and, and people either out of the industry, uh, they've been outsourced or, or the company's kind of folding. And so I've been saying, okay, well, I'm kind of, what am I going to do for, for keeping a roof over my head and food on the table and everything else? And so I said, okay, well, I was already uh, ready and set to, to create a novel I've had this idea sitting out there on a shelf for several years now, and let's do it. Let's 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 go out there now and, and see what we can make happen. Uh, so, so we launched the campaign on October or not October on April tenth. Um, uh, we had a really fabulous first couple of weeks. Um, we're in the middle of what I call the Kickstarter doldrums. Uh, when all your your pledges plummet to near zero, and you're sitting there chewing off the ends of your fingers, going, "I don't know what's going to happen." Um, and you know, I, I will say that we have not really made the progress that we need to be making so far. I'm hoping that we can get out there and, and have more people hear about us. Uh, I, I def definitely think that your uh, posting our, our interview from last week helped. Uh, we, we definitely picked up some people after that, and so I'm hoping that. This one and also your follow-up interview, we, we get some uh, more bounce from that. Uh, also hoping that we can get one of the, the big geek websites to pick us up. So Laughing Squid, if you're listening to us, uh, or io9, or Taku, or any of you folks, uh, I, I would really, really love a shout-out from you guys. Just give me a call. I will talk your ear off. I'll tell you anything you want to know. I'm surprised um, <laughs> to hear you say that. I, I figured you could just, hey, I did Betrayal of Crondor. Send your checks to, you know, this address. Mm, well, what the, why are you having trouble getting the word out about this? Well, there's a couple of things. It is Number one, Kickstarter uh, is a great platform for a lot of things. Fiction, not so much. Uh, because it, it's like uh, you have a, the Kickstarter publishing stuff, and you see the stuff that's down there. Um, for the most part, I just don't think that the audience of people who read a lot and the people who are kickstarting are necessarily the most compatible kind of audiences because it's not like you've seen with game companies we've seen a lot of sort of mid to high level tier gaming companies coming in and kickstarting we haven't seen Stephen King come in and kickstart a, a novel we haven't seen anybody else like that kind of come in and so it's really a very kind of small universe and so I think for a lot of people also I think there's this mindset of well it doesn't cost anything to write a novel. You just sit down and you write it. And, and so it's, it's not like a game where you've got all these other things or making a movie, you've got to hire actors, and you've got all this other stuff. It doesn't cost anything to make a book. And, and I said, that's, I wish that were true. I, I wish that it just, words magically fell out of the sky and, you know, three weeks later, bang, 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 I'm done, and there's the novel. Uh, but that's not the way it works, and particularly not for a science fiction or a fantasy novel. You know, because I'm creating the whole universe. I have to think about, you know, how does magic work? How do dragons work? How do all of these crazy things that change the way society works, the way everything in the universe, you know, functions? And, and in order to do that, you've got to spend a lot of time just sitting down and thinking about, you know, you're ch changing sociology, changing reality. Uh, and you have to do all that stuff before you can even really seriously get started on the story. Uh, and so you've got tons and tons of lead time. Um, and so, uh, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, I, you can write the book in your spare time in 15 minutes here and 15 minutes there or whatever. And, and, you know, I know some writers that can do that. I'm not one of them. Uh, you know, I, I'm somebody that whenever I, I start writing, for the first hour, I'm just sitting there typing and go, this is complete crap. This is awful, you know, or whatever. And the, so the first, the first hour or so is complete junk. 
And so maybe in about hour, hour two, I finally get into something. I'm working along doing this is great. This is fantastic. Oh, crap. Um, what's the range of a longbow? But are we talking about Welsh longbows or English longbows? And we kind of start tearing all this stuff apart. Where we're okay, I've got to stop and do research. And so I call, or I, or I call up my friends and say, okay, I'm on a planet that has three moons. How do I calculate tides on this planet? You know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm emailing my friends and I'm seeing out all this other stuff. And so that four hours of writing time that I've allotted, maybe I've only got an hour, maybe two hours worth of actual writing time done. Um, and that said is, is that because there's sort of that long lead in time of that I'm kind of just not really getting, getting anywhere, having fragmented, <laughs> having fragmented moments where I can write stuff, I just, I, I can't effectively get things done. And so the idea behind the Kickstarter is, Buy me some undistracted time where I'm not having to go out and get a contract, where I'm not having to go dig ditches or work at 7-Eleven or whatever the case may be uh, so that I can, I can spend some concentrated time actually working on, on the book and, and actually make some real traction on it. So, so and again, like I say, it's just, I, I don't think Kickstarter and, and fiction titles are really nat natural uh, companions, at least not yet. I, I think that there, there still needs to be that break up novel project where everybody goes, oh, well, yeah, let's go to Kickstarter and, and, and back novels. Um, so uh, I would love for Thief of Dreams to be the, that book, but I, you know, I, I, I don't I know. watching some uh, Raymond E. Feist. He's got some videos, uh, like interviews on YouTube, and there's one where he's talking about his mm -hmm. writing process, and I think he says he wakes up at 5 a.m. every morning, and you know, it's just basically a workhorse. Have you? Yeah. yeah. Have you tried to get an endorsement from from uh, from Raymond Feist or? Well, uh, I I got a shout out from Ray on our launch day or whatever, and so uh, I you know in, in terms of an endorsement or whatever, it's hard to kind of endorse a book that hasn't been written yet, you know. Um, and so and and I, I really haven't I haven't tried to push him in regards to that because you know. Think about it is he's got tons of people that get sent manuscripts from this guy and that guy and everybody else under the sun. And so authors really don't like the idea of, hey, endorse my book. You know, and, and it's even worse, like I say, with, with something that doesn't even exist yet, other than a handful of notes and everything. Uh, Ray and I know each other and everything, but it's not like we're really the best buddies or anything either. You know, we worked, I, I adapted his work before, it, that worked out well for him, it worked out well for me. Uh, but it's not like I'm on the phone with, with Ray every day, um, you know. And he's a good guy. I'm really excited for him because he's he's got Magician's End coming out, which is the last Rift War book. So uh, so that's kind of interesting synchronicity for this year because it's a big year, a year for several reasons. We've twentieth anniversary of Betrayal at Crondor, uh, and obviously we we have this campaign. And, and again, the, the, me starting this this particular year is actually just kind of accidental. But it kind of works out the way is the fact that here's this, this story that's at least inspired by a character from Betrayal at Grondor. And then, of course, like Ray releasing the last book. So just kind of an interesting coincidence is kind of all going on this so year. So have you changed up the stuff from the, the game and, and Feist world? Is it sort of the same world, um, the, you know, the, but the names have been changed or is it completely different? The, the only thing that's significantly – or well, not – the only thing that's, that has a great deal of connection to the original book is the main character uh, of Owen. His, it's basically the same family that he had, changed some of the names there, whatever. So it's basically the same kind of family relationship he was going to have. If we had actually seen the, 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 game ver you know, the game of Thief of Dreams, we were going to meet Owen's family, his brothers. Uh, and there's kind of a big uh, murder thing that happens at the beginning of that. And Owen's kind of helping solve what happens with that. And... Um, but other than other than the, that fact, pretty much everything else is different. Because again, number one, uh, Ray wouldn't be too terribly happy if I went in and say, "Well, we're going to go down to uh, the, the princedom of of Kindor, uh, and you know, here's Morath, and and you know, um, Tug. But um, <laughs> yeah, Tug. Yes, yes, Tug. The great magician Tug. Um, um, but. Um, so anyway, uh, that's we're, I can't do that, and I don't want to do that uh, because obviously, uh, there. I, I think the opportunities that we had with this is, is to create a whole new universe, and, and that's why you get into doing this stuff, anyways. Because I have an opportunity to to tell a new new story and exciting kind of new universe, and so uh, very little of what uh, was in that original storyline will remain. Like I said, the main the main connection is through the main character. So he was named Owen. His name is now Eris. 
Um, and so, uh, other than that, no connection. Now, it's the sort of grand plan here to write this book, create this universe, and then there'll be some games based on it later on? Or, or you know, have you thought in that, that way? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I you know, started off, uh, you know, uh, Whenever we started the whole kind of wheel, uh, you know, uh, talking last year about, well, a, a betrayal of Crondor remake, well, what form would that take, you know? And, okay, the, the license not available. Well, do, will we create another game based on it? I said, okay, well, what would a spiritual sequel to Betrayal at Crondor, you know, look like? And I started thinking about that and ways in order to make it a little bit different and different, exciting. Uh, and so. Um, oh, Betrayal in Antara so, never came up. And well, no, we'll see. Of course, I didn't have anything to do with Antara, you know, and so as I, as I tell people, as I said, that I was gone from the company whenever that happened, and none of the original team members had anything to do with it, so that's not a judgment call on them. I'm simply saying that we had no association with it. Um, so, um, uh, but anyway, so there, but there is that kind of issue of what would that sequel look like, and so I think a lot of people, of the people who have backed this, have all pretty much said, asked the question: Is this going to be a game? Is this going to become a, a game world or whatever? And, and the obvious answer is: Well, it's got to become a book first, <laughs> um, uh, because uh, you know, it's one thing to raise twenty-four thousand dollars; it's another thing to reach up and ra raise a million or three million or what ha what have you. And whenever you've got a large established game company like Gas Powered you know, that has a hard time reaching a million bucks, and me off, you know, going, hey, hi, you know, I'm a game designer, and I've done stuff, cool stuff, I have no team right now, but give me a million bucks, uh, um, that, that's a, even a, a little higher cliff to climb than, than just trying to get the book done, and so, uh, so obviously, as, as hard as it's been kind of trying to raise the money for this, I don't even think about going through that process of trying to assemble the team and do all that other stuff for, for an, a spiritual sequel, at least until I know this is kind of in place and, and I can get this done because th I would like very much like this to become a fictional setting for, for a new gaming uh, something. And so in all likelihood, probably the, if, if a game were to come out of it, it probably would be very Betrayal at Crondor-ish uh, because obviously the, the, the way the kinds of systems we were developing and everything else for the original Thief, uh, because of the character development that I have here are going to be, it would be very open for, for that sort of thing. Um, so, um, and I think it lends itself well, too, because, you know, the, the whole narrative idea is, is you've got spies and you have all these different fractured kind of countries. And so I, I think that it would lend itself well to, to that kind of, kind of uh, experience. Do you have any puzzle chests in the, in the novel? I was thinking about, you know, you could put some kind of puzzles in there. Um, yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, I, I think that, that definitely you're going to see them trying to decode things and encrypt things. You know, because again, that's that's a big part of the 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 shtick is is that I'm a spy, so I'm I'm hiding messages and I'm doing other stuff like that. So I I, I don't know I don't know about puzzle chess, but but there probably will be some little. Um, uh, if if do you ever read? Um, there was a great novel by uh, what's her name? She wrote a book called The Eight. Uh, Susan Neville. I think her or whatever, but but she actually would embed little weird puzzles and stuff in her her novels, um, and so that was actually actually uh, I read a lot of uh, I, I read the eight and there were some other books like uh, Umberto Echo which you read his stuff and it's like okay weird strange abstract things that are, are kind of embedded in there, and so I wouldn't be surprised if a few things like that kind of creep into the book, uh, just because I like that it, 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 I like having that kind of of meta event that's going on inside the book is there there's a book but there's a puzzle within the book and so i have to kind of figure that out so uh uh so yeah i'm, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna, gonna say say no <laughs> i i just don't know for certain yet uh, what those might be yet but uh, i've got to get a lot further into the narrative before i can i can say for certain well, obviously as far as the writing style and the genre and everything it's you obviously have a lot of uh, inspirations from a uh, feist but i'm just wondering are there other fantasy authors that have influenced you that you would kind of kind of look to as, as role models? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that, of course, uh, a, a lot of my writing style, right, that that I have, uh, you know, particularly when for writing this novel, because the origins kind of go back to to Crondor, uh, you know, obviously we're going to be high, heavily inspired by by Feist stuff. 
Uh, also by Janny Wirtz, who uh, actually I, I really love the Empire series. I, I in particular, Janny's uh, Janny brought a slightly different spin to Ray's universe, and so I think I was I was actually heavily influenced by Janny whenever we were doing uh, stuff. And actually, my first proposed sequel would have actually taken us to Kelowan. Um, but we couldn't do that because it, it meant us also buying Jenny's rights or Janny's rights. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately we couldn't make that happen. Uh, but, but the other people who, uh, who have continually inspired me, uh, through the, through my whole writing career, uh, Tad Williams, he's a huge, huge, uh, influence on my work. Uh, Guy Gavriel Kay, um, and I, 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 th those two are really kind of, I'd say, when I think about the authors that I most try to be like, uh, it's, it's between Tad and, and Guy because they make you hurt, <laughs> you know, uh, you have these moments where these characters have these terrible decisions and you just know that, that oh my God, that this is horrible and, and I'm in pain because, you know, the, the, this decision has to be, ma be made, but someone's heart's going to be broken or some great character I love is going to die. Um, and both Tad and Guy do an exceptionally good job at, at doing that, uh, is just giving these wonderful, emotional, conflicted kind of choices. Um, in terms of sort of, not necessarily stylistically, but sort of story-based uh, kinds of stuff, um, uh, an, there was something that I, re I read when I was a kid called Lord Darcy Investigates by a guy by the name of Randall Garrett. And he actually was doing mystery, sort of Sherlock Holmes with sorcery. Um, and so um, there was only a handful of books that he wrote. But there was Lord Darcy Investigates and um, there were a couple others. Um, and then, uh, another very kind of strange, uh, a strange one for, for a lot of people would be, um, Necroscope by Brian Lumley. Uh, because th the great thing about Necroscope is he had the whole, whole e-branch, uh, where they're using, uh, weird supernatural powers, uh, as part of the British intelligence, uh, 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 or whatever. And so certainly I was very inspired by those kinds of stories, um, and, uh, definitely would recommend either of either of those titles or, or those authors to go check out because uh, great, great stuff. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, other authors that, that, that are kind of influences, not so much on, on this book, but that, that influence sort of me personally, um, uh, Glenn Cook, um, I love his work. Um, and um, um, who am I trying to think of right now? Oh, uh, Lindsay Davis. Uh, uh, Glenn Cook and Lindsay K uh, Davis are both authors I love because they have a great sense of humor uh, in their writing. As is that that even even though things will be very serious or whatever, they, they still find the humor in the moment, and it's not inappropriate. It's not like here's and here's a pratfall, but they find here's the weird, absurd thing about being in this this circumstance. And I always love I love that kind of stuff. And so um, and Lindsay Lindsay Davis does uh, mystery set in Rome. So that's that's uh, kind of fun. Anyway, so those are those are sort of my, my handful, of sort of my my big influential authors on me. Other than like folks like Bradbury and Lovecraft and and Tolkien, the sort of the big obvious ones. Uh, is there a place to go? I mean, obviously you could play Betrayal of Condor to get a sense of your writing style. But do you have any excerpts or other uh, writings that people could read, get a kind of get a feel um, for what this well, is going to be like? Yeah, I mean that's that's the hard part of it. Of course, you know, I I went in with this basically saying, you know, my my core the the people who are going to be most likely to back this are the people who've played my previous games. You know, uh, I would have written short stories and novels and other stuff in the past, but the pro the real reality is, is, I go in, I work fourteen hours, eighteen hours a day at a com computer game company writing about dwarves and elves and dragons, and I come home and a I'm exhausted. You know, I've been at work all day, and number two is just like the creatively, it's hard to find the extra time to now I'm going to create an entire other universe and write something there. And so uh, it's not like there's tons of other stuff people can go read. Um, uh, in order to get kind of a, 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 a sense, not necessarily of my, my storytelling uh, skills, but you get a sense of sort of what my writing style can be like, uh, you can go pick up uh, Derailment of the Sunset Limited, which is a nonfiction uh, a, a story that's available on Amazon. Uh, there's also uh, Swords and Circuitry, Designer's Guide to Computer Role-Playing Games, and uh, there, there's definitely a, a lot of my style uh, is in that that book, and also actually I think there are even 
as I recall, I think there's even actually some of the story from Betrayal of Prondor in there, so you could check that out as well. What kind of reactions have you gotten from, from fans and Kickstarter backers so far? Well, I mean, the, the, the people who are the backers, uh, again, uh, are the, the, the faithful. I, I knew that, you know, these are the people that are showing up and, oh my God, Betrayal of uh, Kronor is the greatest game ever. You know, I wish I had $3 million. I would fund you for the next 50 years. Uh, and and it, it, that's the great, wonderful, heartwarming thing, you know, is people saying, and, and I, I, I have no illusions, that's the reason these people are showing up. For the most, they are 95% people who have played my previous games. They played Betrayal of Crondor, they played Dungeon Siege, and they thought these were fantastic, wonderful things, and so, so they're, they've been overwhelmingly positive. You know, we have a troll, uh, but that happens. Uh, you know, that that's just gonna, you know. Oh, no. Uh, uh, but, but, well, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. It's, every, every, you know, campaign out there, particularly whenever you have a tier that's open for one dollar, uh, <laughs> You know, and we, we have it available for people who say, you know what, I'm completely broke, but I support you, man. I just want to, here's my thumbs up, you know, or whatever. So here's my $1 tier, and you come in and, and do that. Uh, and the, the sad fact is that some people say, oh, here's $1. I want to come in and mess with you. Uh, but it's not a big deal. Because the, the advantage that I have is, uh, I, you know, 99.9% uh, .9 of the people in there are rabid fans of mine. Uh, and so they all have my back, so I'm not really that worried about it. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I've, I've had uh, again. I've, I've, over, I've had pretty much overwhelmingly kind of positive response from from people. Uh, the backers are all all seem very excited. Uh, they all wish that obviously we were further along, uh, and uh, you know they're oh well I can double my triple I can triple my pledges I can you know or whatever. I said no, I don't want you to do that. You know because I I, I actually honestly I would be much happier if I could fund this game on twenty four thousand dollars or for twenty four thousand people donated a dollar. Uh, as opposed to having a small handful of people say, oh, yeah, I want to you know, contribute $3,000 or something else like that. I mean, yes, it would get the, the project funded. Uh, but I just don't like that. I, 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 don't, I would much rather people say, you know what, here's my buck. This is, this is worth it for me just to see this happen. Um, and, so, um, uh, and then whenever it gets done, I can say, hey, great, you know, here's a shout-out to all the people who helped me make this novel, and they can see their name in the front of the book or, or, or what, whatever. And so, uh, so I intend to do that. I'm going to have that in the book somewhere. They can see you know, people who have made donations here in the back. Here's, here's your name. I helped make this happen. Um, and so, so again, you know, um, I, I'm not going to stop people from making really large donations, mind you, uh, but I, I don't want people to feel like that's how this has to happen. You know, we're only going to make this happen by making ridiculous pledges because, you know, people have lives, they have mortgages, they have stuff they need to do. And, you know, throwing ridiculous amounts of cash at me, I'm just going to feel guilty <laughs> uh, about it. It's just like, yeah, I sent you $7,000. Know, I, I, you know, I think there's lots of people out there that they, they have a passion for creative enterprises like this, but maybe they don't have the time, maybe they don't have the talent, but, you know, maybe they've got the cash. You know, yes. so this is a way uh, for them to feel like they're participating in something that's artistic. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I, I've been keep on hoping for, and and uh, is I keep on hoping to find that there's got to be a celebrity out there somewhere that that played Betrayal at Crondor and thought it was the greatest game ever. The only thing about it is, is that in a lot of cases you know about it, it says oh and so and so they're a really big player of Ultima Online or so and so they're a big fan of this or whatever. I've never actually run across that guy. Or that that girl that said, you know what? I'm a you know I'm a superstar in, in this major television series, and I really love this. I wish I could find that one person and say, give me a tweet today, and I can fund this thing. You no, know, I, um, I yeah, we will tweet be great. Of course, I actually have at least some ties to sort of the Trek you know universe because my friend uh, Larry Nemechek that I'm doing a documentary with that I'm I'm the director of photography for. Uh, he's he's sort of uh, he's like Doctor Trek. Everybody comes to him for to, to get their Trek questions answered or whatever, and so so I know he's out there trying to feel around to see if we can find some people. But but yeah, I'm I you know I would love it if like Chris Hardwick or or any of those guys and like I say, just one tweet out of them would pretty much fund the project probably. Um, so uh, but anyway, so here's hoping if you're listening and you're out there, um, um, uh, just give me a tweet and and I'd make me a very very happy guy, but. Anyway, but and also to you, man, I and I'm not trying to undermine uh, you at all. Uh, I, I, you're like I say, you're 
uh, uh, we definitely saw a spike in donations in the next in the day or two after your program started airing. So I, I know I know where that was coming from. So I, I do appreciate. It. <laughs> But I think, you know, I got to hand it to you. I, I actually was on the RPG Codex a while ago, and I, I see where you've actually been sort of posting there. Well, I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, the thing about it is, is that I had to turn them uh, because whenever I first posted it or whatever, I actually had a lot of people kind of bashing on me at first. Uh, and so I understand. And the thing about it is, too, is the, the Codex in particular is a very passionate and very opinionated group of people. Um, and, and I love them to death. The thing about it is, is I, I know the, the fact that, that I'll, I'll particularly, I know some of the people that run the site, they're big uh, Betrayal at Crondor fans. And so I knew to some degree that was sort of like, okay, this is home base camp, you know, or whatever. And of course, they're primarily in the business talking about games. You know, we're, we're kind of on a front, you know, we're out here talking about a novel. So this is not necessarily their first, you know, uh, the, the thing that they're all most excited about. So if I were talking about, so here's Thief of Dreams, and this is the world we're doing, and here's the game we're doing, I think we'd have more people in there donating and, and talking about it. But at the same time, is uh, again, I don't want to leap into trying to fund a game and do everything until I know that I have the resources available that I can actually do it and we can get across the finish line. Because uh, I'll be honest, this is Kickstarter number three in six months. <laughs> Um, and as, as, you know, I think you just, you kind of mentioned at the beginning of, 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 uh, the previous one, uh, uh, that, that, you know, we, this, we were, we'd gone through Thorvala and we went through, through, uh, uh, Wild Man. Uh, I have to admit, it's just, it's extremely nerve wracking to be right here in the middle of another one of these campaigns again. And, and, you know, in both the cases of Thorvala and Wild Man, those were other people's projects. They're friends of mine. They said, Hey, Neil. Uh, I'm going to need somebody to help me write story for this. If this happens, would you like to be involved? And I said, yes. And so pretty much how they were run, how they were implemented, all that other stuff that was really kind of in their, their ballparks. And I was glad, more than glad to help them out because, these, again, these are friends of mine. Uh, the gaming world is very, very small uh, at the end of the day. We, all, we are all about one degree away from, from everybody else. And so anything I could do to help them out, I was glad to do. Um, but again, again, that's it. So I'm in the middle of my third, third campaign. Both Thorval and Wildman went down. Thief of Dreams isn't looking very good right now in terms of where we you should be. $8,500 uh, right now, something like that? Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. I, I don't, I, it, it's in, the, in that ballpark, like I think. It might be a little bit lower than that. Uh, well, yes, it's <laughs> refresh, 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 refresh. And, you know, my, and, of course, you know, Jane is, every once in a while, my wife is, is pulling me out. She's just, Neil, you have to get away from the computer. But, and actually, because the funny thing is, is that some of my biggest donations have come in while I've not been here. She said, here you go. Here's the perfect proof. The, the watch pot. Just go away. Leave it alone. It'll, it'll either go up or it won't. And, and, of course, the hard part, too, is that trying to create update materials, which is a little more complicated with a book than it is with a game or a movie or something else like that because – with the, the, you know, a movie, say, here's the concept sketches, and let's see what the, the costumer is doing, and let's do, you know, there's all this stuff that you can throw at an update, you know, and the same thing with a game, uh, with a game, it's like, here's game footage, and here's, you know, so-and-so, let's interview them and talk to them about programming, and this is me, you know, and so I'm simultaneously trying to do all the work of, of doing the promotion for the campaign, which people who've never run one have no idea how much work it is to run one of these campaigns because I get up at seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning and the first thing that I start doing is I'm, I'm going out, I'm posting on websites, hey, hello, let's go out there, do, does RPG Codex, uh, are, are they talking about stuff, do I need to go in and address anything that's going on in there, I find, I find you know, I'm on Facebook. through different accounts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, and so I'm just I'm just in there, you know, uh, so so all day long, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on all this other stuff, and I'm trying to answer questions, I'm trying to find interviews, I'm trying to do all this other stuff, and it is exhausting. Then on top of all this other stuff, I'm going out and I can write stuff, I can write simple text updates, which are great, people respond to, but what people really respond to is video. So, which is kind of seems ridiculous, is needing to shoot video to write a book. Um, and of course... Shooting video is like, okay, well, I could sit in a chair and just talk to you, you know, uh, which uh, by and large would be okay. But, but um, uh, I think mo most people respond a little bit better if you try to make it a little more entertaining than that. And that becomes a whole challenge in and of itself. It's like, how do I make this visual? 
how do I do whatever? So actually yesterday was kind of fun because we were out shooting, uh, shooting my next update. And so I'm standing next to a lake and I've got a, uh, it's 90 degrees outside, but, but I've got a, a overcoat on, uh, and my wife is throwing, uh, throwing, wa dumping water on my head. Uh, and you have, <laughs> and you have to watch the next ep update to see what that's all about. <laughs> um, but uh, that's just the kind of crazy weirdness that, that we were kind of going through to say, okay, we've got to make this entertaining, we've got to make it interesting, but we also are visualizing what I'm talking about. <clears throat> and so, so that's a challenge. So, uh, so, you know, doing a video shoot, I'm out for a day or two shooting video, then I'm in, in the house for the next day or so editing. Uh, and so there's all that um, on top of all the running the campaign. And so I have to say, I'm exhausted. You seem uh, to have a lot of, a lot of pep now. <laughs> well, I actually got a good night's sleep last night, um, but uh, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's it is it is a, a nerve wracking experience to run a Kickstarter campaign. So for any of you out there who think this, oh, this is easy, I'll just go on and I'll start my campaign and money will just fall from the skies, you know, uh, no, no, uh, you you spend every minute you just kind of watching it's like hit the refresh button. Okay, click, 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 click. And okay, okay, it's a dollar, get a dollar, give me, give me another dollar. Hello, 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 hello. Um, and so, uh, particularly for those of us who probably have a tiny bit of, of ADD to begin with, it's just a nightmare. Uh, so, well, do anyway, you have a, um, a plan B if this doesn't make? Uh, well, I mean, plan B, honestly, is the fact that, that uh, I mean, I, uh, this, the idea here is that if this happens, you know, um, I'm not going to have to, you know, I don't have to, to kill myself trying to find a, you know, I'm, I'm still going to have to have some kind of a gig to kind of keep myself alive, but I can at least take a lower pressure gig <laughs> uh, so that I can write the book. Uh, if, if this doesn't, doesn't happen, then I'm going to have to figure out what my primary gig is going to be. Uh, and that's just very hard right now because the gaming industry has been shedding jobs like no one's business over the past, you know, six months in particular. Uh, and so uh, I've been looking, you know, I, 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 unfortunately just one of those things is from the beginning, I didn't take it as, as a given that this was going to happen. Uh, and so you're sending out resumes and you're, you're trying to, you know, court clients and, and all this other stuff. And so there are people I'm talking to, uh, but none of that's, you know, that's, that's no more definite than this is. Uh, and so, um, uh, so if this doesn't, if this doesn't happen, will I try to write the book? Maybe, possibly, I'm, you know, uh, you know, here, you know, try to write this chapter at a time. But the main part is is going to be is finding those large chunks of time when I'm not having to do something else, so I can keep a roof over my head, feed my my wife and myself, and and everything else. Uh, and so that's just the practical reality is it is work. And so if I'm not doing this work, then I have to be doing some other work. Um, so uh, so the plan B is. Maybe at some point this novel gets written, but it doesn't get done in a year. Maybe it's done in two years. Maybe it gets done in ten years. I honestly can't say. Uh, but but uh, unfortunately, I, the one thing I can say for certain is it will not happen anytime soon uh, if if this goes down. That's one of the things about Kickstarter is if you got all the way up, to the, almost got to the goal, maybe you got $100 left. I mean, at what point would you just say, okay, I'm going to go to the... You know, <laughs> go to the, get a loan or something to cover this last. Uh, oh well, I mean, show. you know, uh, I, I will say that if we get within a certain, uh, I've got get, get within a certain margin. I can't really say what that margin would be, uh, but I've basically been told that if I get within a certain margin, and it looks like we're going to run short, I've got an airstrike that will come in and help us. Um, but, uh, but I've got a, I've got a lot of territory I'm going to cover before that air, airstrike will be available because it's this, this is not going to be a case of someone that can throw, you know, tens of millions of dollars at us, but they might be able to help us, you know, uh, you know, if we get to a, a narrow enough gap, a reasonable gap, they may be able to help us. And so, uh, but, uh, that said, we, we've got to get to that line first. Uh, because they can't, unfortunately, they can't close the distance between where we are right now and 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 the end of this campaign. Um, well, it seems like if uh, so, you know, if you already what I don't know what the percentage is. Hey, you had a, we're uh, we're about thirty four percent right you know, now. So it's obviously, I mean, just that to me is pretty clear that there's a desire for the book out there. So maybe you could take that. Let's say it gets to. Closer, even you know, maybe maybe get like seventy five, sixty percent. Uh, that seems like you go mm -hmm. to a publisher at that point and say, "Look, 
<laughs> Here's hard evidence. Well, that there's a demand. Well, the, the, the thing is, is that that uh, Kickstarter, or, or you know, I, I think that a publisher, I, I really doubt a publisher would, would respond well to a Kickstarter uh, because I, I think that yes, it does show evidence, but then now they've got this complicated thing of okay, the, we've got the donations coming in, but how does that fit? Because we, you know, my pledges have specific. You know, tier rewards associated with them, and some of them are these deluxe versions of the book. I mean, if you want to reach up all all the way up to the top tiers and the thing, I've got a leather bound copy of this book available. You know, in a carved wooden box. You know, it's an awesome little thing. But the publisher's not going to want to do that. You know, and the same thing with hardback and a paperback. And you know, being a first time author, in all likelihood. Uh, despite however many fans I have here and, and whatever, they'll probably you know they're gonna say maybe I'll give you a paperback, but but again, uh, most paper, uh, most publishers don't like this. They they consider this the mo the worst kind of of self publishing, <laughs> you know, uh, and self publishing it's bad, it's evil, and everything else, um, and it threatens their their business model, you know, uh, because it's like cut the middleman out. I'm just like hi, I'm I'm making books, and you want to buy books, and so let's get together and, and have a party. Um, and so, um, so anyway, like I say, I, I would like to talk to some publishers and see if there are in, any interested, but honestly, I'm very skeptical or dubious about whether they would want to get involved with Kickstarter. Uh, because if so, it really does fundamentally change the way they have to publish their books and deal with their books and everything. Um, but, you know, there's nothing saying that, hey, you know, we, we, we self-publish the, the first book. Says, there's nothing to say a major publisher doesn't pick up a sequel. You know, or whatever, because because then you say, hey, well, we know they have an audience. You know, here's their audience. We, this, we had to know something about who they are and what they're all about. I'd laugh um, if you ended up in the situation where you were making a game uh, based on this, but due to some kind of publisher licensing <laughs> licensing agreements, you had to go back in yet again and change all of the <laughs> the details. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, uh, that would just be strange. Uh, but it would be even stranger well, if Raymond E. Fives doing the game based on. Oh God. <laughs> well, of course, Ray's universe by itself is, is an oddball because I don't know if everybody realizes this is that Ray's universe started off as a tabletop uh, role playing group here in San Diego, and so they had the world of Midkemia, and Ray was developing this area out in one corner called Crydy. And so he basically asked the rest of the people in the group and said, hey, would you guys mind if I wrote a novel set in this universe? And, of course, they say, oh, well, whatever, because they're probably not thinking, oh, well, you know, go, sure, go write a novel, what, no big deal. Not imagining they've got this guy that's about to turn into a New York Times bestselling author on them, you know. Uh, but the great thing is, is Ray has an arrangement with, with them, and, and so they get paid whenever he gets paid. So it worked out for them. Um, uh, but so it's kind of funny because so you had a game that became a novel, which became a game, <laughs> which then had a novel based on it. Um, so it's this weird, <laughs> uh, strange, loopy kind of history that 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 Crondor or that that uh, the, the the Feist universe has had. So so we might have a strange situation where this starts off as, an, as a novel, which turns into a game. Um, I would like to make the next progression, then we go to a movie from there. Uh, but we'll see. Well, is there anything else, uh, Neil? You want to say about the book? Um, uh, should have been well. Um, well, the main thing is just just go check out the website um, and uh, uh, you know uh, give us a look. And and again, if if you like the portrayal at Crondor, if you want to have an idea of uh, you know, since I'm speaking to gamers here or whatever, if if you liked the the kind of story that there was in Betrayal at Crondor, if you liked the text that was in the game, because again, for for those of you who might not be aware, is that Ray didn't write the story in Betrayal at Crondor, I did. Um, and all the text that's in that game, I wrote. Um, and so if you like Betrayal of Crondor, or if you enjoyed that story, if you enjoyed that, that, that style, that was me. And so if you enjoyed that, you should enjoy Thief of Dreams. Because again, main character is inspired by Owen. Uh, so, so there you go. If, if, uh, if, 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 I, don't know, I don't really know how much I make a much more of a pitch than that. Is, is that if you love Betrayal, you should love the Thief of Dreams. Um, and uh, uh, the, one, the one thing I really could use from you guys, obviously pledges, it would be awesome, uh, but if you can't do a pledge, I understand it's a hard time economically for everybody. Um, you know, I, please, please don't pledge unless you, you have the resources to do so. Um, but one thing that would mean tons to me is please, please, uh, please share, tweet, 
talk on forums. I mean, I'm on our RPG Codex. I probably got that covered. But if you have other forums uh, that are out there uh, that I just don't have the opportunity to get around to every day. Uh, so if you know places, um, contact Laughing Squid, io9, all those people say, please, please send a shout out, you know, about that. So pressure any, and if you're a celebrity, the guy that I was talking to about before, you know, uh, if you're a huge fan and, and you're on some major television program with huge, a fan base, uh, man, please give me a call, give me a tweet, something. Uh, that would just mean the world to me. Um, so um, that's probably about it. Um, but, um, and man, I, again, I, I appreciate you you giving us a shout out here um, because uh, uh, it, it means a lot to me. Yeah, thank you. And just to kind of go with what you're saying, too, I don't think people realize how much influence they may have. And posting something on their that's Facebook exactly. wall, a Twitter, you know, a tweet, something like that can have a network effect that they would just never even imagine. Well, just so, so, just so everyone knows, is about 50% of my traffic comes from people coming in from Facebook postings. Uh, and so, uh, so, and then pretty much all the rest of the net <laughs> makes up the other 50%. Uh, so, uh, so again, your Facebook po uh, uh, postings mean a great deal. And just so you, you understand is that people are 70% more likely to respond to a recommendation that you make for something than if, if they just happen to stumble across me talking about this. Uh, and so, uh, so you may not think your friends listen to you, but they do. Um, and so, uh, so it's very, very powerful. And also, too, is if you can personalize that link and not just like, here's a link and say, hey, I used to play Betrayal at Crondor. It was the greatest game in the world or Dungeon Siege or Planet's this Edge. guy's a lunatic. Just, you know, Planet's Edge. Hey, wow. The handful of people out there that still remember Planet's Edge uh, out there. Actually, it was a gas seeing that in the, the previous I installment you had. I about that. You know, people saying, wow, this is, I didn't know you did Planet's Edge. Those are my favorite games. Yeah, well, that, that was my first from the beginning, from scratch game that I ever designed. Uh, so, uh, so again, if if uh, uh, but again, you your tweets, your shares, uh, your your chatting in in in, uh, in forums, it it means a lot more than you think it does. And so, uh, so if you can help us uh, kind of boost the signal that way, I would really really appreciate it. And uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I'm trying to make. Uh, the best possible novel I can, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, just understand is that, that I'm trying to get this bulk of time so that I don't have to bash out a novel that's just, okay, he knocked it out in a month. You get the novel that you deserve. <laughs> you know, that, that, uh, that, that, that you, you, if you knock out a, a novel in a month, you, it's going to read like a, uh, something that, that got through in his spare time. I want to take, I really want to take the time to do this the right way. I, it, I took a year to write Betrayal at Prondor. So, and, and that was about the equivalent of about a 400 page novel. And so I'm, I'm more experienced than I was whenever I wrote Betrayal at Crondor. But the flip side of the coin is, is I had Ray's Universe to play with the first time around. I didn't have to world build that much for Ray's Universe. So I could just concentrate on, on the story and all that other stuff. And so uh, I want to be able to take the time to do this right. And that's what that, that's what that, that money uh, does. Also so, also, so you understand too, is that I don't get all of that big chunk of money that you're seeing. Is that I I'm, I'm, I lose about between thirteen and fifteen percent to Kickstarter fees to, to Amazon payment fees and also just accounting for the fact that some people are going to pledge but their money won't actually go through um, and so some of that money is just not going to happen uh, and also I'm paying my cover artist Sean Sharp um, uh, by the way our, our cover artist is Sean Sharp he uh, is uh, one of the art directors for Guild Wars. So, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so if, uh, if, uh, that's, that's another kind of reason that maybe you want to kind of show up is, is again, uh, Sean is, is involved with the project and he's also pledged to do some extra artwork for us that we're going to have kind of a little sketchbook of some of the characters and stuff in it. So if this happens, there's some awesome art coming from one of the Guild War, Guild Wars artists there as well. So hopefully that's a little bit of an extra incentive as well. How much do people need to pledge to get a copy? Um, of the book. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, a uh, electronic copy of the book. Uh, there's a so the electronic copy of the book comes in at twenty, I think it is. And of course, the thing people go, "Well, it's a lot for an electronic book." I said, "Yeah, but you're not just paying for the book. You know, it's that that if if this was only about pre-selling the books, then we would need to hold a Kickstarter. You know, the book is done, and 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 uh, this is this is about actually saying." I'm allowing you, you know, yes, I'm, I get a copy of the book, but also I get, you know, uh, I'm paying for your time to write the book. And also, 
I have to advertise this. I have to print this. You know, so th I'm paying for a lot of overhead. <laughs> What about uh, that leather-bound wooden box thing? That's oh, the the leather rant. Well, that's way up there. <laughs> yeah, inked in blood. Well, also and also too is uh, as with every tier is that there's the tier on top and it has everything below it as well. So that's also uh, an audio book of the entire thing. There's a paperback copy of the book. Uh, there are uh, there's a cloth map of the world. And all that other stuff, and that's that. The um, the leatherback or, or the leatherback comes in, I think, at fifteen hundred, I think, or whatever. Um, uh, I, I can't I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's like fifteen hundred. Uh, and also, too, is there's some crazy stuff too, because whenever you get to, I think it's twelve or fifteen hundred dollars, uh, that if you donate that level, I also will I will consult on a short story of your choice. So if you're writing a short story and you want some some input from somebody who's been doing this for a while. Uh, you basically buy a consultation from me uh, for doing that. If you get really crazy and you have ins you're insanely wealthy and have nothing else to do, at the $5,000 le level, I actually let you make a choice. There's going to be at one particular moment where there's a big choice about what happens in the game. I'm going to let you participate in what I call the coin toss moment. I'm going to let you choose what happens. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so it's an important moment in the book. Uh, you know, it's obviously not the whole book, but, but it's an important moment in the book, and you're going to get to choose uh, what happens in that coin toss moment. So, uh, so that's if, if you have really insanely deep pockets and, and you have nothing else to do with $5,000. But <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so anyway, so we have all kinds of pledges. So we, we start at the bottom with, uh, with like I said, an e-book. There's a paperback. There's a hardback version, a hardback with a slipcase. You're going to sign like a leather, a leather back. You're going to sign what? The, sign the books. Uh, yes. Well, we have well we have signed cop copies. We're going to have some of them that we'll have uh, book plates for. You know, so you, you know, like you get a signed book plate. So you can decide whether you want to put it in your book or you just want to have the signature to put in there. And so we kind of leave it up to them to decide whether they you know what they want to do. So some people say, oh well, I don't want, want to deface the book, but having it signed plate that I can kind of slip inside there is kind of a cool thing. So they can decide whether they can uh, they want to attach it or not. And of course, we get to custom signed versions. So there's just signed versions, or say, okay, now I'm going to custom sign it to you. Hi, I love you, and and I've I've I've. So glad that, that that we've known each other for our entire lives. Love Neil, you know, <laughs> whatever. 